Good evening. My name is Brianna Spivey and I attend Spelman College. <laughs> My fellow colleagues and I will be reading a few quotes from Dr. King. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Hello everyone, my name is Noah Spicer and I attend Morehouse College. The function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. We must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. Hello everyone, my name is Dajane Gembrell Sanders and I'm from Clark Atlanta University. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a greater person of your nation, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mesa Anderson, and I attend Drew Charter School. Darkness cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hello, my name is Jordan Washington and I attend Chapel Hill High School. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Good evening, everyone. I'm Vicki Crawford, director of the Morehouse College Martin Luther King Jr. Collection. I welcome you here this evening. Uh, the King Collection uh, Lecture and Conversation Series is in its ninth year, and this year's commemoration is especially important because it's the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. And we honor him, as I know that you know, in a context that social, political, and economic problems persist. So that this is a very special year for us. Also here at Morehouse College, uh, Dr. King uh, received his undergraduate degree. And Morehouse has been so important in the formulation of his intellectual and, eth and ethical ideals. So this annual observance is very important for us here at the college. Our theme this evening is looking back and beyond the unfinished work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We chose this theme tonight because we want to acknowledge the importance of history, of telling the story, of remembering the narratives of the many men and women who like Dr. King gave their lives to change circumstances in our nation and the world. And while we look back lest we forget, we must also look forward to envision and to create new strategies and new approaches to solving many of the pressing problems and issues of our times. We look ahead to innovate, to reimagine, and to develop new thinking and understandings. It's really good to see so many young people in the audience. We're so glad that we've got school systems here, DeKalb County, Atlanta schools, and other schools here, because this is the challenge for the young people. You must do it. You must go forward. Uh, in one of Dr. King's last books, he prophetically said that the book was titled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos Our Community. And in that book, Dr. King stated that he talked about something called the triple evils, what he called triple evils of racism, poverty, and war. And he said that these three oppressions, coupled with other kinds of structural inequalities, were primarily responsible for many of the world's injustices. And Dr. King offered even further that in order to realize what he called the beloved community, that where all human beings are valued and where we all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that we've got to tackle these triple evils and other oppressions. Because if we do not do that, we will perish. And he went on to say that in order to do that, it will require a revolution of values. So this evening, we celebrate Dr. King's life and legacy in the spirit of worldwide fellowship and the recognition of what he called the fierce urgency of now. 
We are very happy to have with us Mrs. Mrs. Marion Wright Edelman, a remarkable leader and relentless champion of human rights, especially the rights of children and the least of these. Mrs. Edelman will first bring a message to us at the podium, and then she will be joined on the stage with, by the president of Morehouse College and one of our outstanding seniors, Lewis Miles. Uh, but without further delay, it gives me great delight to bring to the podium the 12th president of Morehouse College. Thank you. It's a delight to participate in this evening's event and an honor for me to welcome you to tonight's Crown Forum and Martin Luther King Lecture Series. It's also been a great pleasure in my first month at Morehouse to participate in the celebrations of Dr. King and his legacy 50 years after his death. There's, he was a personal hero of mine, and actually it's through having been um, mesmerized, actually, by Dr. King's work in the Civil Rights Movement when I was too young to be out in the streets protesting. Uh, I would read everything I could about Dr. King, and it's through reading his biography that I actually had a vision that one day I would come to Morehouse. I wasn't able to come. 40 years ago when I was applying to college, but uh, after uh, 50 years of wanting to be here, I finally made it, so uh, I'm extremely happy. Dr. King is undoubtedly the best known of the people that we can legitimately call heroes of the civil rights movement who transformed this country. But I think that Dr. King would be the first to say that it was not he as an individual that changed our world through that movement, but it was he and a collection of people who provided leadership in multiple ways who actually transformed this country and the world. And tonight, we are blessed, in my view, to have with us one of those heroes, the heroine, <coughs> Marion Wright Edelman, who I first had the chance to meet when I was a young freshman at Yale College and she came and sat with a group of us in a very small conference room to talk to us about what it actually meant to engage in struggle. Struggle intended to change people's lives as she was doing then and had done in the years prior and continues to do today. Uh, so with that, I welcome you and look forward to the evening. Thank you.
Greetings and good evening. My name is Lewis Miles. I am a senior sociology major, and I have the distinct honor of introducing the speaker for this evening. Unwavering in her commitment to justice and undaunted by the challenges in fighting for freedom, Ms. Marion Wright Edelman has spent her lifetime advocating for disadvantaged people. She is founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund, and her resilience and compassion can be seen in her leadership of the CDF, which has become the nation's strongest voice for children and families. The Children's Defense Fund leaves no child behind mission is to ensure every child has a healthy start, a head start, a fair start, and a safe start and a moral start in life and successful passage to adulthood with the help of caring families and communities. Mrs. Edelman is a graduate of Spelman College and Yale Law School and began her career in the mid-60s as a first black woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar. She directed the NAACP's Legal Defense and Educational Fund office in Jackson, Mississippi, and in 1968, she moved to Washington, D.C. as counsel for the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. began organizing before his death. She founded the Washington Research Project, a public interest law firm, and the parent body of the CDF. For two years, she served as the director of the Center for Law and Education at Harvard University, and in 1973, began the CDF. Mrs. Edelman served on the Board of Trustees at Spelman College, which she chaired from 1976 to 1987, and was the first woman elected to the alumni as a member of Yale University Corporation, on which she served from 1971 to 1977. She has received over 100 honorary degrees and many awards, including the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Prize, the Heisman Award, the MacArthur Foundation Prize Fellowship, and in 2007, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest honor for civilians, and the Robert F. Kennedy Lifetime Achievement Award for her writings. Again, it's a distinct honor to introduce her and to have her here this evening. And without further ado, would you all join me in welcoming Ms. Marian Wright Edelman to the stage. I love being here. Thank you so much. I love hearing the Morehouse Choir. I was privileged to be in the Morehouse Spellman Sunday Morning Choir and with the great Wendell Whalum and to hear Dr. Mays give instructions on how we are supposed to be when we grow up and go out into the world but I feel like the luckiest person in the world to have been born who I was, when I was, with the parents I had, with the community elders I had. I didn't want to come to Spelman, I wanted to go to Fisk, but my mama said I was too young, and I came to Spelman, and it was a wonderful experience, even though I chafed against the being home, being in by five o'clock and going out in groups of threes, but the, but the atmosphere and the presses and the presence of great leaders was absolutely marvelous, and one of those great leaders um, was Dr. King, who was very accessible to young people, um, and that's something I try to remember when young people want to spend time and talk and ask questions, but I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me, and congratulations on your new president, and I look forward to hearing and getting to know him better. We all are aware of Dr. King's great speech at Riverside Church, beyond Vietnam, we called it, where he called not only for an end to the Vietnam War, but for a true revolution of values. The war, he proclaimed, was but a symptom of a deeper malady within the American spirit, and he warned us about the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism, which, if left unchecked, could destroy America and all of God's creation. He said that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defenses than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And with a sense of urgency, he called upon us all and upon our entire nation to move past indecision to action 
and to remove those conditions of poverty, insecurity, and injustice, a call that we need to renew and honor today with a great sense of urgency. Now that very hard but achievable vision, I believe, beckons us more than ever. In a world teetering on the brink of nuclear suicide and spiritual insanity, desperately hungering for moral leadership. We have made some but far from enough progress in overcoming the, our tenacious national demons of racism, poverty, materialism, and militarism, but sadly the passionate pleas Dr. King issued so many years ago have not been fulfilled fully and is too often unheeded, and here we find ourselves in this year at a period when there is no other way to say it, we are living in an era of unmitigated evil, where the last 50 years of progress to overcome many of these issues and these concerns, I think is trying, is, is in process of trying to be reversed and we should make sure we determine we will not go backwards and we will fight it with all of our might. Our leaders continue to talk about peace while spending trillions preparing for and waging war. Since Dr. King died with the Vietnam War raging, the Department of Defense has spent over $15.6 trillion on the military. And America has become the world's leader, if you want to call it that, in military expenditures, exports, and nuclear capabilities. And the nations of the world continue to worry about the threat of nuclear war. Poverty, hunger, and sickness ravish the bodies, minds, and spirits of tens of millions of children in our materially rich but morally stunted nation and world. This year does mark the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign, which Dr. King began organizing in his final year to eradicate poverty. And one of the things I loved about him so much was how accessible he was, how much he would come out when he was called into the field when there was a big crisis. And I remember him going to a poor Head Start Center that we were running and the government had cut it off because they thought we were promoting social change. We were. Um, but um, he came and um, was to, to do a funeral in Marks, Mississippi. And he went into a Head Start, one of those Head Start Centers that were then temporarily um, unfunded, and saw the teacher cut up one apple for five children, and he broke into tears and had to leave the room. And I remembered again how accessible he was, even when there was changes with the march on the Meredith March and Stokely and and Ricks all began to talk about black power and everything being too close. But he would every night in the breaks in the marks would sit and listen to everybody complain or to share their concerns. He listened, he had the patience of Job, and I always loved that. He always found time when he was at Spelman, when I was at Spelman, to find time to talk, to sit down, to think, and I'm so pleased that what he said and the thing that I remembered, and one of the things I hope young people would do is keep a diary. I had a 15 cents or 10 cents notebook, which I kept throughout my year as a Merrill Scholar, but then when I came back, and, I'd, and you forget so much. And I remember finding, in the I left it in the chaplain's house at Yale, one of those books, and that turned out to be about my senior year at Spelman College. And I finally, it got sent to me years later when the, the, the successor to Bill Coffin moved and became master of one of the Yale colleges. She finally could decipher my writing after lots and lots of effort, and it arrived, and that is the book called Lanterns. But it portray, it recounted my senior year at Spelman, the sit-in movement, and my first time hearing Dr. King in chapel, and the bottom line of what he said that day is what has helped guide my life. Um, since then, it was never go backwards. He says, if you can't fly, you drive. If you can't drive, you, you run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl, but you go forward. And that is our message today. We are going to go forward. We are never going to go back to the old ways of doing things and the old inequalities. And so I think in remembering his life tonight, that the issue should be how will we continue to make sure that that dream becomes a reality and that we take his mandate and his life and his sacrifice as a mandate 
to move ahead and to end poverty in this country and to end, for me, child poverty. And we will, in two months, be issuing a new call to end child poverty in America because that is what is required of us. And so I hope that we will all respond on this 50th anniversary, because it's been very clear that whatever you call poor adults, nobody wanted to do anything about. But if you call it poor children and talk about cost effectiveness, we've been able to get 50 laws on the books because it makes sense. Babies are not culpable. Um, you can hate their parents, but what are you talking about when you're talking about hurting babies? And we have got to focus on strategically on prevention and cost, effection, cost effectiveness. And so stay tuned because the way we want to honor at the Children's Defense Fund, Dr. King, is to end the poverty of children and to make sure that every child has hope. And in his final years, as you know, he called for the Poor People's Campaign um, that came really out of his continuing travels in Mississippi, out of Marx, and out of what he began to see. But in 1967 in Mississippi, hunger was becoming epidemic. And after the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party challenged the Democratic Party in Atlantic City, and that eventually changed the Democratic Party in significant ways, um, it was very clear that the state of Mississippi wanted to run people out. They wanted them just to leave. And they began to change um, um, and stop with um, free food commodities and put them on food stamps and charge $2 a person or per family, and people didn't have any income. They began with chemical weed killers to make the sharecroppers obsolete and to push them off the, st off, the, off the land. And they, with violence and every other economic repression means, began to say, we want you to leave. Um, and hunger became a real epidemic. And repression became worse after the Atlantic City challenged the Democratic Party. And people were beginning to starve and nobody wanted to hear, and the poverty program was there, and, they, and we were able, because the state of Mississippi turned down the Head, Head Start program, we were able to, as community groups and church groups, to apply for it, and we ran the largest Head Start program in the nation. And first thing I've, anybody ever tries to do is to sort of say you're not using the money honestly and charge us with fraud, and we began to defend ourselves very vigorously as we kept trying to get refunded. But we did, but it was always an extraordinary struggle. And I remember calling him up to see if he would meet us in Atlanta, shocked side, Sergeant Shriver to see him walk in and said, we should be having an outsider. And I said, he's not an outsider. And he's standing up for those young people he knows. But that eventually led to hearings in Washington, and that eventually led to Bobbitt Kennedy coming to Mississippi to verify the extraordinary hunger that was occurring in Mississippi and the bloated bellies and the children that were looking like third world children, and it was a very hard time as they were attempting to push them out. They put in a new minimum wage um, for agricultural workers, which um, again led more people to push more sharecroppers off, and it was a very bad transition period in 1967. But Dr. King always responded, but it was a very depressing time, and after hearings in Washington, um, we were able to get Robert Kennedy to come and look at the Head Start program, see that there was not fraud in what we were doing, and then to go up to the Mississippi Delta and see some of the children with bloated bellies that um, Dr. King had seen and been moved by. Um, Robert Kennedy brought the press with him, and it brought a big new move to see if we couldn't stop the starvation of children in the Mississippi Delta. But boy, did the bureaucracy hold on and hold slide back because the Mississippi delegation was very powerful. But again, the Kennedy force was very important, but they still were not getting food down to these starving and hungry children. And in frustration, and again, I feel so privileged to have been at the intersection of great events and great people. Um, I went back to Washington to complain, and every time I went back to Washington, I would always talk to Robert Kennedy, and he w was very upset, as I was, that we were still not getting the food down there. The Vietnam War was going on. Nobody wanted to offend the Mississippi powerful senators who controlled the, the military appropriations. And I remember sort of you know, saying to Robert Kennedy, what are we going to do? And he had really been pushing. And he said, go, as I told him, I always did, stop through Atlanta to see Dr. King on my way back to Jackson. Tell him to bring the poor to Washington. And I did. And I loved Dr. King because he, his, he, he didn't always, he never tried to hide 
when he didn't know what to do when, when, his, when he was struggling. And I love that sharing of struggle. And young people need that to know that we are uncertain, but we trust God and we take that first step in faith. But I came back through and went and saw him and he was sitting in his very modest, unprepossessing office and he was depressed. And he was often depressed and, 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 and worried about what is this next step because after the Riverside Church, all of his friends had abandoned him. And he was criticized by blacks and whites alike and we wanted to ghettoize our conscience, but it was a great speech and he had great courage. And what, he was sitting in the back of that office that night and he was clearly depressed when he walked in but then when I told him what Robert Kennedy had said, he said, that's it, we'll do it. And he began to start the planning process. His staff were not very happy with him and were not very happy with me, but nevertheless, the Poor People's Campaign became his obsession and he was extraordinary. And he stuck, stuck with it and he really challenged the riches and most powerful among us to recognize that children by the millions living in poverty was unworthy of America and that we had to do something about it. And again, he was like a pit bull and I am so grateful. And I think everybody should reread and study and parse out that Riverside speech, but the things that he laid out in terms of the triple evils are the ones that we still have to confront. He would not be happy today that on that 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign that we have made some very significant progress. And all those people who pronounce it a failure and we're gonna be publishing all the contrary evidence. I wanna thank a lot of those people in Resurrection City if you're enjoying food stamps and you're enjoying WIC and you're enjoying, enjoying summer, summer breakfasts, morning breakfasts and lunches. All the significant expansion of maybe 25 to 30 laws in a lot of ways came out of a resurrection city. Change is not glamorous, it is systematic, it is hard work, but I don't believe and will be showing, in my view, that Poor People's Campaign led to the public interest lobby and made all the, the current things that we take for granted a reality. And so we need now the second phase and it ought to be focused on ending child poverty in America. So again, stay tuned. It is a disgrace that we have 13.2 million children who live in poverty, over six million of them in extreme poverty. Every other American baby is non-white and nearly three in 10 black babies are poor. 150 years after slavery was legally abolished and despite numerous efforts to end hunger, and we have made huge progress. One in five of our children still live in food insecure households, lacking consistent access to adequate food. Countless children have been deprived of their innocence and trust and hopefulness and worry daily about whether they will ever grow up to adulthood. Incredibly, many of the richest and most powerful among us don't want to recognize that enough is enough as millions of children continue to live in poverty and don't really have food to eat. And we've just, thank God, this week gotten the CHIP program re re reauthorized. And those nine million children will get help. But we, it should not be so hard. It should not be so hard. When one looks at that tax bill that has passed, where the the, 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 the divisions between the rich and the poor are at one of its highest levels ever. When one looks at how we're enriching them more in a context where the richest eight people in the world have as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's population and one American hedge fund manager who's gonna get even richer, um, earn 1.5 billion in, in 2016, the latest data, which is about $125 million a month or 28 $1.8 million a week, $4.1 million a day, and $171,232 an hour. That's making more in one hour, one man, than three elementary school teachers make in a year. That's wrong, folk, and we should stand up against it and ask for fair investment of our resources in this very rich nation. And yet we are talking about how we, we've got to spend all of our time trying to keep poor children's food, poor children's Head Start, poor children's child care. What is the matter with us? In order to continue to line the pockets of millionaires and billionaires, it is time for a new movement 
and they should be focused on ending poverty, but you can, you can't, if you end children's poverty, you can't end children's poverty without helping their parents, but they are the better wedge, and so stay tuned. The senseless violence that King, Dr. King and Robert Kennedy decried and which took their lives continued to romp through our children's playgrounds and terrorize their Head Start centers and child care centers and public schools and attack them walking the streets in their neighborhoods. Um, Robert Kennedy, after Dr. King's assassination, said, what we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. Shamefully, since 1963, violence has ended the lives of 182,830 children and teens in America. And it, that equals 9,141 classrooms of 20 children and is more than three times the combined number of American soldiers killed in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. We need to stop the killing of children. We need to get the NRA from stopping being our defense department. We have got to curb guns. When we did the first focus groups of black children, their main concern, which shocked me, was that they would not live to adulthood, and their parents' main concern, that they would not live to adulthood. And so we began our first child gun violence campaigns, but we are still seeing our children mowed down and their futures and their hopes eliminated because of early deaths. 65,947 black children and teens have been killed by guns in recent years. In the last, since 19, in the 1970s, more than 16 times the recorded lynchings of black people of all ages in the 86 years from 80, 1877 and 1950, where is our voice? We have got to have the current anti-lynching campaign to stop the killing of our children by guns, and you need to do it with us. We must keep our children alive. And I hope, again, that you will stay tuned. We must stop the killing of our children. The most recent child gun data reports 3,128 children and teens died from gunfire in the most recent data. That's eight every day, one every two hours, and 48 minutes. Our children are terrified in many of our inner cities and other places, and just as guns threaten the lives and safety of our children, the growing cradle-to-prison pipeline in our nation threatens the racial progress Dr. King and others sacrificed so much to achieve. We must stop the incarceration of our children and make sure that incarceration is replaced by coming to Morehouse and Spellman, that children have hope, that children see a future. The day after Dr. King was assassinated, there were riots all over, and I went out into the public schools in the District of Columbia to tell children not to riot and ruin their future. And a little black boy stood up and said to me, lady, what future? I ain't got no future, I ain't got nothing to lose, and I have spent the last 50 years trying to prove that boy's truth wrong. We've got to have a movement to keep our children safe and to give them hope and to give them a future. The country needs it, we need to have it, our children need it, and we've got to break up that cradle to prison pipeline so that our children can go to college. States are spending on average two and a half times more per prisoner than for public school pupil. That's about the dumbest investment policy I can think. We should stop it and we should hold our leaders in Congress and in our state houses accountable for making sure that we change our priorities. While some people of color and women have earned a place in the corridors of power in mainstream American society, we're still seeing the bottom be much too big, and we must begin to address the problems of those children who are left behind, particularly those in extreme poverty. And so, again, I hope that in celebrating Dr. King and, and having all these observances that we will then follow Dr. King and make sure that we finish the job together to end the excessive militarism, greed, and materialism and close the unprecedented gap currently between rich and poor and make sure that the downward mobility of large numbers of our children is stopped. I don't think that this is any way for any of us who live by our faith and say we believe in God or in most of the great religions, any of the great religions, can say thank you to our creator for the life and earth he's given us and tolerate 
the millions and millions, indeed billions of people who don't have enough to eat and who are not safe and can't basically get the education they need to have a foothold in their societies. So eradicating child poverty is a big down payment on ending poverty. And we had a Nobel laureate from MIT, Bob Solow, look at the cost of doing that, and he concluded that it would be a great bargain to eliminate child poverty, that we cannot afford to keep poverty at its current level, and that you know it costs about a half trillion dollars every year in school dropouts and dependency costs to keep then over 14 million children in poverty, and it would cost far less to eliminate that poverty. And so I think that the economics is on our side, morality is on our side, we just need to get ourselves together and make sure that we decide that we're gonna stop this expensive scourge on our nation and on our young people, and particularly on our black young people. He said, Dr. Dr. our economist, um, and uh, Bob Solo said that, you know, the report that we issued was very good and it still stands up called Wasting America's Future. And he said, for many years, Americans have allowed child poverty levels to remain astonishingly high, far higher than one would think a rich and ethical society would tolerate. The justification when one offered it all, offered one it all, has often been that action is expensive. But we have more will than wallet. And I suspect, in fact, that our wallets exceed our will, but in any event, this concern for the drain on our resources completely misses the other side of the equation. Inaction has its cost, too. And as an economist, I believe that good things are worth paying for, and that even if caring for children's poverty or curing children's poverty were expensive, it would be hard to think of a better use in the world for money. If society cares about children, it should be willing to spend money on it. We commissioned the Urban Institute three years ago to look at nine policies to eliminate poverty, and they came back and said that we could have an impact if we invested in these nine policies, from housing policies to early childhood to education. And we're updating that, and we'll be releasing an updated version in about two months in our call for that being our real national effort over the next two to three years, or as long as it takes to end this scourge of poverty in our community. But we concluded from just investing $77 billion in nine policies that we could decrease overall child poverty by 60% um, for all children, white, black, Latino, and Native American, that we could decrease black child poverty, and the black child is the poorest child in America, shame on us, um, by 72%, and we could lift the floor for everybody. And so stay tuned because I think that by honoring him, wanting to honor Dr. King's sacrifice and finishing the first big step by helping children escape poverty and have opportunity, that we need to come together and say this is going to be the way in which we remember him and honor him and give our people and our children hope. I still am haunted by going out into the, the streets where the kids were rioting and a handsome 12, 13-year-old boy, and that boy who said to me, and I repeat it very often and remind myself in the morning, when I will, you want to sort of not do something or make that extra effort. When I said to him, don't go get into trouble, please don't riot um, and get yourself jailed. And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, lady, what future? I ain't got no future. I ain't got nothing to lose. I don't ever want to hear a child say that. I want that child to say, I am going to get ready to go to Morehouse, and I'm going to contribute to everybody else. And so I think that Dr. King blessed us with his strong faith, with his great courage, with his spiritual traditions, with his prophetic preaching. He shared moral clarity and spoke in courage and truth. He left us an unrelenting commitment to justice for the poor and every one of God's children. He showed us the path to peace through his example and his call for massive nonviolent action. And ultimately, he gave us his life for justice and for peace and for equality. And I hope that we will honor him not just with statutes, not just with memorials or holidays, but with our absolute committed action to make sure that every child has a chance to have a good start in life and a good education and to contribute that is the way I hope we can honor him. And so I want to end with a prayer about us reaffirming 
our commitment to caring and being willing to serve because his was a life of service and his was a life of sacrifice. And we should have no excuse for finishing what he died to help us achieve. Lord, I can't preach like Dr. King or turn a poetic phrase like Maya Angelou, but I care and I'm willing to serve and to stand up with others to build a movement to save our children, all of them. I can't sing like Marian Anderson or Fannie Lou Hamer or organize like Ella Baker or Byatt Rustin, but I care and I'm gonna be willing to serve and stand with others to provide that voice for our children and give them hope. I'm not holy like Archbishop Tutu or forgiving like President Mandela or disciplined like Mahatma Gandhi, but I can care and I'm willing to serve and stand and vote and organize for our children. I'm not brilliant like Dr. Du Bois or Dr. Mays or Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And I'm not as eloquent as Sojourner Truth and Booker T. Washington, but I care. And I'm willing to serve and stand with others for our children and be the voice that our great people like Dr. King provided for us to follow. I don't have Mother Teresa's mindfulness and, saint, and, and <coughs> saintliness, the Dalai Lama's or Dorothy Day's love or Cesar Chavez's gentle, tough spirit, but I care and I'm willing to serve and stand with others and do whatever is necessary to end child and family poverty in our rich nation. God is not as easy as the 60s to frame an issue and forge a solution, but I care and I'm willing to serve and stand with others to make a difference for our children. My mind and body are not so swift as in youth and my energy comes in spurts. But when that young energy comes in spurts, say I care and I'm willing to serve and stand with others for our children and some of our best lobbyists are grandmamas and grandfathers who come to help their children who are in their homes and who want to have a better future for them. I'm so young, so many children say, and nobody will listen. I'm not sure what to say or do, but I care, and I'm willing to serve and stand with others to build a movement for our children. I can't see or hear well. I don't speak good English. I'm tired. I stutter sometimes. I get real scared standing up before others. That's all right. Get up anyway and say I care and I'm gonna love my children and my grandchildren and other people's children and have a safe country where they can walk down the streets and sit in schools and not worry about dying and being attacked. And I'm gonna build that movement for our children. Lord, please use us as you use Dr. King and the people who came before us and inspired us to save our children today and tomorrow and to build a nation and a world where no child is left behind and every child feels welcome. I thank you for this celebration of Dr. King. Let's honor him by building the loudest, nonviolent, persistent, successful movement so that every one of our children can see college and not prison in their future and where they can walk down the street safely and where the NRA is retired as our Department of Defense. We can do this. So that's the honor I would hope that we would use for Dr. King. Thank you. Thank you so much for that speech. Um, and again, it's an honor to be in your presence. Um, so I'm going to jump straight into uh, my first question, which is about kind of like the nexus of the past, the present, and the future. Um, in your journal on the date of April 10th, 1960, um, you reflected on Dr. King's uh, speech at Spelman's uh, 79th Founders Day. Um, in which he said four mountains needed to be removed. The mountain of uh, moral and ethical relativism, the mountain of practical materialism, the mountain of racial segregation, 
and the Mountain of Chronic Disorder and Violence. And that was in 1960. So I, my first question to you is, uh, what mountains do you think need to be removed today, and what advice would you give to those attempting to move mountains, particularly the youth? Those mountains are still around, and so we should not have any illusions about that, but we have, look at what the progress that we've been able to achieve through nonviolent direct, the progress that we've been able to achieve against those mountains that he outlined in Spellman's Chapel, um, and overcoming it through persistent nonviolent sacrificial action. And so I still affirm that is the best way to proceed. But secondly, I think that there are things that we have learned and we have made much progress. And one of the things that I hope is that we will have a strong youth voice, college voice, high school voice. We have revitalized and have about 200 freedom schools based on the 1964 summer project um, in Mississippi to keep children out of harm's way, but we put a real integrated reading curriculum underneath it, and it's taught by bright, smart, non-white, largely 89% black, Latino, Native American, and um, Native Hawaiian young people, whom I hope are gonna become a non-white teacher pipeline. The majority of children in our public schools, I'm trying to keep everybody out of law school. We don't need more lawyers. We needed lawyers back then. But what we need now is good public school teachers who, so children can walk into these public schools and see somebody besides the cook and the janitor. And they need these role models. And a lot of our young people are changing their majors and they're going into teachers. Praise the Lord, if you can sort of do that because they really do need that. And I think that every black college and every college, and we've got them on a lot of college campuses, I believe as well, with Morehouse and Spellman and every black college, and Claflin's got an all-black freedom school, male freedom school, ought to have a freedom school so that children can see something called college and not prison in their future. Mm. You can't be what you can't see. And so I hope all of us are gonna sort of redefine what they think they can become and have these role models that they see are really being successful and caring. And so I just think this is really is movement time. And we've got to organize nonviolent action. The student body presidents ought to be out here organizing votes and getting ready for the strategies and for the issues and the agendas we're going to push. And so we've got all the power. What we did in the sit-in movement with nothing, and we never had nothing um, to get things done, but our faith in God and our belief in wanting to lift our community. Um, I think it's time for the next movement, and we have a lot of experience to build on from Dr. King and subsequently. Thank you. Um, to springboard off of uh, the idea of freedom schools, my next question to you is pres to, do, to you, President Thomas, about King's legacy. Um, how can we better embrace Dr. King's legacy, teachings, and practice here at Morehouse? And where and how does Morehouse continue the unfinished work of King in fulfilling the vision for a global beloved community? Well, I think it starts um, to build off of uh, Marion's comments with the leadership of the school and the faculty of the school supporting our students in being activists around the things that matter to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and supporting the idea that they are responsible for taking the action to make the world that they want to create. And our, in some ways, making sure that we don't get in the way of that, but that we support that. And then bring to it some of the lessons that I think we can take from Dr. King and the actions of the civil rights movement leaders uh, as we at Morehouse pursue our vision to develop men with disciplined minds to lead lives of leadership and service with the emphasis on leadership and service. And you know, when I think about Dr. King as a leader, uh, four things come to me that um, I would want the young men who come out of Morehouse with the intent to lead lives of leadership and service uh, to know about themselves. One is the idea of vision. And Dr. King was led by a clear vision of the world that he wanted to create and what the values were that should underpin that world. Another is the importance of communicating and how you communicate your message. 
Uh, and um, I used to, I spent 30 years teaching and teaching leadership. Uh, and one of the things I used to do is teach some of Martin Luther King's speeches and ask the question, what can we learn about the way he communicates? Even though, you know, most of us will never be a Dr. King, but what can we learn that actually applies to all of us? And one of those lessons is this notion of when we communicate, it's important to communicate on three levels. Logos, is there logic to the vision? Pathos, does it connect to some emo something emotional in people that pulls them in a positive direction? And ethos, which is about meaning and identity. Who will we be after this change and will we be better than we are now? And if you think about uh, Dr. King and his communications and who he was speaking to, he touched all of those. The third is moral authority. You have to live a life that gives you the moral authority to ask more of people. And you live that life by example. And being able to ask the question, what do I have the moral authority to ask of others? Because we see lots of people who want to be leaders, but nobody will follow them, and they don't quite know why. And it's often because you don't have the moral authority to ask that of others, given how you live your life. And the fourth principle that when people talk about transformative leaders, we seldom talk about is transformative leaders are also healers. To create change, you have to break things. And to complete the transformation, you have to be about healing. And I think if you look at the lives of Dr. King, uh, who very much you know, preached from a place of love, even when he was criticizing some of the most fundamental aspects of our society and being castigated and demonized. Um, you know, another example for me who comes in a, in a similar vein is uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, you go to prison for the best years of your life. You come out, now you can run the country. And many of your own people are telling you it's time for payback. But his approach was the approach of healing. And I think there are many leaders who came out of the movement with Dr. King who made similar choices to be healers even in moments when they could have declared themselves the victors and demanded the spoils. And I think that that's critical. And if we can instill that in the young men who leave here, whether they go to lead in you know, today's civil rights movement, which I think has to be about education. I've written about educational reform. But I also think the great thing about the opportunities in our society today is that uh, we can create partnerships that will motivate change. And back, you know, kind of back in the civil rights movement, it seemed like it was mostly about the government and the people. You want to get, you want to create change, mobilize the government in your direction, the politics. Today, I think we can think about businesses being part of creating transformation, NGOs. Uh, there's just lots of ways to think about mobilizing people where those same principles of vision, communication, moral authority, and healing apply. And I think we can do even more than we do to help our students leave with an understanding of that. Thank you. Appreciate it. So um, maybe, it's, maybe it's time for us to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, last question, because I understand we are certainly pressed for time, um, but this is a very crucial component of, of the lecture series, is understanding mentorship. Um, we're talking about King, and we understand the role of Benjamin Elijah Mays um, and 21st century leadership. Um, so with this next question, I hope to merge you know, many of the mentors that are, are in the audience and their mentees um, by asking, you know, you, Ms. Edelman, you talked about the range of mentors in your life, including your parents, community ed elders, Howard Zinn. Um, you've even talked about you know, how you met Dr. Mays when you were just 13 years old. And you, Dr. Thomas, have talked about the importance of, of 
mentors for minorities, particularly in corporate America, um, and how sometimes people look up to the most senior people um, without you know, paying attention to people who might be directly above them um, for the incredible possibilities of mentorship. So uh, when we reflect on the life of King and your respective experiences with mentorship, have your ideas about mentorship changed? And what do you think mentorship requires or looks like in the 21st century? Let me just say one, I again want to just say how blessed I was to grow up who I was with the adults that were in my community, because we were owned by the community. I mean, if we were someplace we weren't supposed to be, our mom and dad knew about it before we got home. Um, and we were community property. The church door was open, my daddy. Everything I do at the Children's Defense Fund, I, my parents did, okay? And if, the, if there was a man with Alzheimer's, we finally realized he was wandering the streets. We started a home for the aged, and all of us children had to go over and cook and clean. We didn't like it at the time, but that's how we learned that it was our responsibility. We, with the church, if there were boys who didn't have parents or didn't have the right parents, the church was always open. And I would get so mad at preachers today who talk about they're not members of my church. I sort of say, that they, come on, y'all. We don't have today, I mean, we had a cohesive community of people who took time with us, who owned us, who nurtured us. Um, and it didn't have to be somebody else's children. It was, it, it, it was we, we had a community. We had a community and we had a clear sense of our faith and of our culture. I had 12 foster sisters and brothers, okay? Um, and we caught my mama cooking for people, six old people, all of whom were younger than she was. We finally had to break her down. But the point is that we had adults who were the kind of role models that we really needed to have. Today, we, I keep saying, we don't have a child problem. We have an adult problem. And the churches need to open up their doors and reach out to these children and to have vacation Bible schools become freedom schools and keep them off the streets. And don't sell me that they're not members of our church. I mean, I, you know, it's just, we, we need to reweave the fabric of community. The outside world is not good. But boy, every morning in our separate and unequal school in Bennisville, South Carolina, we sang the Negro National Anthem. We had oratorical contests. We knew what Ralph, my head, now bunches was my oratorical contest. It fits. He said in 94, the barriers of race can be surmounted. We need to enrich our children about their history, about what black folk have overcome, about what the world is like. And they need to, but we need to do it with them. So that I think our children are desperately looking for community, for guidance, for leadership, for mentorship, for lanterns, okay, um, all over, because I sure had good, and all of them lanterns, they weren't educated, but they were wise, and they loved us children, and we've got to reweave that kind of culture and fabric again, particularly with so many external messages that come from the media um, and from so many bad places in this society. You've got to have a core of what's important. And so I think that what we need to do is to keep, just reweave the fabric community. We bought Alex Haley's farm, and we bring people back together. And I think that freedom schools need to become Sunday schools, and if they became Sunday schools, the Sunday schools will become revitalized because they're reading and doing things that they think is important. So we really need to reclaim our children and give our children the examples. And so I think that if we adults can get our act together, the children will get our act together, and we need to be speaking up when they are mistreated. And we need to be fighting and causing a movement and voting for them when we get to that next election. We should have not, you know, the CHIP program had a, had a constituency. But we can make this country in child poverty, have equal education. Our, we still have separate and unequally funded education at every level. We need to be yelling about it. So it's an adult problem that we've got to cure and the children will fall in line if they hear us speaking up for them. And in freedom schools, they're learning how to speak for themselves, and they are making changes in their own community. So we need to empower them, and empower them through their history, and empower them through adult support. Why did I agree to follow Marion Wright Edelman? Um, I just want to uh, uh, first just say um, uh, that I agree with everything that uh, Marion Wright Edelman just said about community. And uh, the question about mentoring, uh, I've 
written about it in a much narrower way, focused mostly on, on careers. Um, what often, what we often glom on when we hear this term mentoring is that it's a relationship between simply two individuals as opposed to what mentoring really evolves out of, in my view, is what I call a network of development, meaning having people around you, not necessarily one single person, who help you grow and learn and develop at the various points in your career and in your personal life. Uh, the concept of mentor uh, actually comes from this notion of a a Greek general who was going off to war who asked his manservant to raise his son to be a man and a warrior, his profession but also his person. And to me, mentoring is about finding people who help us to integrate who we are with what we're going to do in the world, and in particular, what we're going to do that can make a difference in the world. The only thing I'd say about how my views about mentoring have evolved that I think are important here is I do think we are in a different time in terms of the kinds of relationships that we need between adults and young people, different from my uh, generation, where in some ways, you know, until you were about 25, 30, even older, you, you, if you were a good mentee, you, you were essentially a, a vessel for taking in the knowledge and wisdom that was coming at you. We live in a world today where I think the learning uh, has to be more mutual because the world is changing so fast. The assumption that only young people can learn from older people, uh, I don't buy into in the way that I once might have sounded like I preached. And I think the way we even move forward more rapidly as a, as a people is to increase the ability to learn across the lines of generations. Because I think there are things that young people today understand about the world that I actually don't understand, but I still want to advocate for them. But if I don't understand their perspective, I think it's harder for them to, to learn from me and, and vice versa. Let me say one more thing, because I had, I had great parents. So did I. I that, that, fabulous that matters, parents. That fabulous parents. But Lord, every night, we had books before we had a second pair of shoes. And every night, my daddy would say, we're going to spend a half hour, we're going to read. And he spent many hours reading in his study. And I snuck a true confessions inside a life magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and we were sitting there, and after he didn't, we were spending our little half hour, he says, now tell me what you just read and what you just learned. Um, and I tell you the truth. I didn't touch another true confessions for the rest of my life. <laughs> and the, the bottom line is that I think children do what adults do. And we really don't have a child problem, we have an adult problem. And we need to turn off those TVs and turn off the junk that they hear and regulate those computers and stop all those noises and give them a sense of what is core and what is important and, and have family bingo games and have family discussions and have family debates and I hope we can have oratorical contests come back um, and read poetry. But we need to reclaim our history and our culture and our ability to relate to each other without all this noise that is in our society. Um, and so all I just hope, I mean, we really, I just can't, children don't do what we tell them to do, they do what we do. And if we can just somehow begin to strengthen the role and voice and competence of parents, and thank God for grandparents, <laughs> um, I tell you the truth. Um, but we've got to begin to reestablish these things because too many external things are raising our children and we need to cut it out. And mm. children need to be silent, they need to be able to be still, and the church needs to be relevant um, and engaging for them. Um, and if it opens up, it will come. You know, if it opens up and addresses their needs and don't say they don't belong to our church and therefore they can't come to the Freedom School here, see? 
Um, but, but I just think that we need to have some very soul-searching things about what kind of children do we want to raise. And then we have to model that. And so... We've got a lot of noises today. I mean, it's very hard to be the best mentor with so much that comes across the Internet and so many other things. So... Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, with that said, uh, thank you so much for uh, being here and to, to be in your presence is an honor. Um, indeed, you have been a lantern to so many. Um, Dr. Thomas, I'm, I'm looking forward to your leadership. Um, and so with that said, that concludes the 2018 Lecture and Conversation Series. Not be moved. We shall not be.
be, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, and we shall not be moved. We're marching up for freedom, and we shall not be moved. We're watching up to freedom. We shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. Tell you that we shall not be moved. Oh, we shall not be. We shall not be moved we shall not be we shall not be moved we shall not be we shall not be moved we shall not be, we shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the water. Don't you let no tweets, don't you let no teacher, don't you let no bully, don't you let no housewives, don't you let no NRA, don't you let no growing up hip hop, don't you let nobody Turn you around, cause you're like a tree. God's planted you by the water. My children, and you shall not be. Greetings, everyone, and thank you. Um, I am I'm Michael Hodge. I am the provost for Morehouse College. And indeed, it's a pleasure to see you all here. And I want to thank the participants of this program for coming out and being with us. Um, you heard a lot. You got a lot of information. I hope you take that with you. It's very important, all the things that you uh, heard tonight. And I just want to say that um, out of all the things that you've heard tonight, uh, one of the things that stuck with me um, was um, Marianne Wright Edelman's statement about her prayer, I care. And if there's nothing else you get from here, take away that um, Martin Luther King once said that life's most urgent and persistent question is, what are you going to do for others? You have to care. You have to care. So with that, I will bring the program to a real close this time. And thank you all for coming. And to remind you that in the atrium, there, is some ref there are some refreshments out there. Please uh, help yourself to refreshments. Enjoy. Network with each other. I miss the closing music for Dr. Uzi Brown and the Uzi Brown Society of Corlears with Ella Lewis as the accompanist.
Thank you, and have a good evening.